to this new episode of the Big Dress Energy Podcast with me, Shkayla Forbes Bell, your favorite fashion psychologist. We're here to get into the nitty gritty. We're talking all about fashion, style, beauty, everything to do with just your general aesthetics, but not just how it looks, how it makes you feel, how it shifts your perspectives, change the ways you step into the world. And I'm super excited for this episode because we're going to talk about being super creative with your clothing, right? A lot of the time, people just pick something that's off the rack put it on them and that's it job's done these two ladies show that you can do so much more than that you shouldn't just be wearing things exactly how they're presented to you you need to make them perfect for you um and it's all about something called endowment theory in psychology which teaches us that when we customize things when we make things our own when we do these little um tweaks to it it actually increases the value of the thing that we've um, adjusted and when we increase the value we place more ownership of it we love it more and that's what we all love here in Victor's Energy Podcast is about putting more value on the things that we wear so without further ado let me introduce my first guest Lydia Bolton Lydia is a sustainability creator and slow fashion designer who founded her namesake brand in 2019 not that long ago and she's had so much success guys a zero waste advocate she works meticulously with sleep sleeping stock dead stock fabric and thrifted pieces to create luxury women's wear apparel as well as teaching workshops and brand partnerships thank you so much for joining us Lydia and Lydia is joined by the beautiful beautiful Rosette Ale she is the founder of Revival which is a London-based fashion label centered on sustainability and specializing in the repurposing of textile waste limited edition capsule collections are crafted from reclaimed textiles sourced from the best of local manufacturers dead stock textiles that were originally designed designed for landfill she's saving them and recreating something brand new drawing inspiration from a fusion of the 90s r&b music era my favorite era and rosette's west african heritage revival brings a nostalgic yet distinct look to the sustainable fashion scene welcome rosette so glad to have you both here right my first question we'll start with you lydia what does big just energy mean to you um, I think to me, it means really dressing in a way where you feel like you can bring your full self. You feel like mm-hmm. you walk in and you feel like you're really bringing, yeah, your confidence. You feel comfortable. Like it's like a self-assurance. Like for me, that's what big, big dress energy is. It's kind of like what you're wearing externally kind of helps you, helps you mirror and feel like your best self. I love that. Clothes being like a helping hand. I definitely agree. And Rosette, what does Big Just Energy mean to you? So it's so funny because I think obviously you play on the like Big D energy kind of. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so like um, I met these like group of girls a while ago um, on like this fashion program and we actually created a chat called Big D Energy. Oh, um, I love it. So we were like, okay, we're going to like show up in the world in a bold and confident way. Yeah, I guess it kind of plays on the patriarchy and men, you know, having that mm. certain level of audacity in yeah. any kind of space. <laughs> so we're like, we're going to do the same thing and we're going to be like these fashion experts. We're going to excel yeah. in our careers. We're going to be sharing with each other and being accountable. And I think, yeah, in terms of how that translates into big dress energy for me, it's kind of like how you present yourself. So being confident. I love yeah. wearing bold colors and things yes. like that. So it's kind of that representation and that outward expression of that confidence and like yeah I'm gonna take up space <laughs> that's brilliant I love that having the audacity I think all of our wardrobe should have those those outfits in there that just scream take this this is me um so Lydia can you tell us about your journey how did you get into your courses your workshops your content like how did it all come together yeah so I always wanted to be a fashion designer since I was like yeah a, a child always was like <laughs> into like all sorts of art and creativity always drawing clothes like just doing everything creative um and wasn't yeah so it was always always wanted to be a fashion designer so went to uni to study fashion um and then after graduating did the, the kind of like the standard process of like interning working in the pub to pay the bills um until I got a job and then got a job at, um, at a brand called House of Holland and worked there for a couple of years oh. 
I love House of Collins. <laughs> um, so I worked there for a couple of years. Um, but alongside this, just sustainability was always really important in my personal life. Um, my mum's like very eco, so I've been brought up in like a really eco-conscious household. Mm-hmm. Um, and just after a couple of years of working, I just kind of felt that I really wanted my career to be more reflective of my personal values of trying to live as sustainably as I could and in a way that didn't like continue to harm the planet. Mm-hmm. So I thought, right, I'll leave my job. So I quit my job, went back to work in the pub to pay my bills and then just slowly grew my brand from there, um, just focusing, yeah, like you said at the in the intro, on reusing secondhand and unwanted textiles. Um, I love that. Yeah. And people think that they see you and all the success, the success that you've had and they think, oh, you've just like kind of been an overnight sensation. But I love your transparency. Like, yeah, the bills still need to be paid. Like, you're going to be yeah. pulling those pints to, to get to where you need to be. But how did you like start with the courses and the workshops? Like, how did that exactly come about? Yeah, so it kind of started, um, I I kind of knew that I wanted to kind of have a kind of teaching element to my brand. Mm-hmm. So my first workshop was meant to be, bef- it was in, um, it was in March 2020. And I was gonna do my first workshop, I just knew it would be a good way for my brand to grow and kind of like, help people remake their own clothing alongside me putting out um, products that I remake um but then my first workshop got cancelled because of mm. COVID happening in 2020 um, yeah which I actually I didn't mind I was really nervous to do it <laughs> so <laughs> I, just away that I, didn't, I was like kind of pleased I didn't actually have to do it in the end um but that was my uh, original first workshop and then over lockdown I did these kits called social distancing kits so it's mm. SEW um and they were little DIY kits that people could get and they had everything they needed in them so like needles threads um and I did one called sass up your socks where you got all like these crystals and beads so you could like decorate your socks yeah um and then I did various like patchworking but very like easy at home kits to like help give people things to do and help them like remake their own wardrobes so that was kind of where it started and then post lockdown I just kind of it kind of just naturally developed from like these kits and like me showing people how to do things into doing workshops. Um, Yeah. Oh, that's great, Lydia. And I I really feel like timing plays a lot into this too. I think over the pandemic and the lockdowns, people really were sitting at homes and just thinking about the things that they own, looking at their wardrobes and really trying to engage in creativity. I know a lot of people got into baking or they got into a new hobby. And I think sewing and crafts, I definitely saw a lot of people engage in that, something I did too. Um, So I love that you actually were able to step into that purpose at a time. It's almost like, yeah, we're you know, like opportunity meets timing. And it's just so like so yeah. perfect. Yeah. So that's so great. And Rosette, I'd love to hear you about how you birthed Revival London and where the name came from as well. Um, so Revival kind of came about in I think it was like 10 years ago when I was in sixth form college. Oh. Um, so I actually was selling um like vintage clothing online. Mm-hmm. Um so I was like upcycling them a little bit, just like changing the buttons or like tweaking them a little bit to make them more contemporary and then selling them online. Um, And the name kind of came from, I guess I did a lot of research on like what I wanted my brand name to be. So I was like, it needs to explain what the brand is, have the brand essence, da da da. Um, So I did a lot of research, just Googling words, synonyms for like ages. (laughs) Um, And I think at this time as well, I was also um, being born again. So that is basically a Christian term that means like, when you know you give your life to Christ, um, mm-hmm. and then you become like a new a new Christian, basically. Yeah. Because um, I was I was raised Christian, but that, I think that personal decision came about around that same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the the name revival basically means to obviously give old clothes a new lease of life. That's what kind of it kind of ties to the brand, but then also a two pronged kind of definition. Also, um, how I was like obviously given a new life through Christ. So it's kind of had that both aspects tying together um so yeah wow that's so meaningful I love that I love when people like bring so much of their personal selves into into the naming of their brand I think that's so important mine I can't even take credit for like big just energy my editor told me about it when I was in Tesco and I was like yeah that's really good let's do that (laughs) and you have this like spiritual like deeply passionate meaning behind it I love that but can you tell us just a bit more about like the steps to starting it like what were you doing when you like first created it like alongside like did you have a career shift or was it always something that you were just doing as a side hustle like to give us a bit more insight 
Yeah, so I was, um, well, I always loved fashion. I think during sixth form time, that was when, like, I was wearing my own clothes every single day. So mm -hmm. um, in school, I was expressive through my hair because obviously we had uniform and I really loved to, like, present myself in a creative way. So I would always change my hair every single day. And then when I got to sixth form college, I was changing my nails and my outfit every day. So I was like, this <laughs> is just heaven. <laughs> so I think that's when I really got into, like, my personal style, figuring out what I liked and exploring fashion and then I also started fashion blogging as well mm -hmm. um so that's where the kind of fashion aspect grew but then I also really love maths so very odd yeah I went to university um so I took a gap year before I went to university and I did mm -hmm. a fashion diploma mm -hmm. and that just kind of gave me an insight to what the different areas of fashion the fashion industry I could go into mm -hmm. or like yeah if I did decide to like not go to university basically yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of like testing the waters and and there was a deconstruction reconstruction um project that we did yes which is basically about taking something apart and then changing it to something else and recreating it into a different piece mm -hmm. and I was like oh my gosh light bulb moment this is like so much fun I really enjoyed that project and I was like this is what I want to do so I kept yeah. doing that on the side yeah. went to university studied maths and then I was like no this degree is not for me <laughs> But I followed through um, and I realized I even though I didn't like the theoretical side of it, I knew that I was a problem solver. Like I knew that I mm. like to look at a problem and see, okay, how can I creatively solve this? How can I come to a you know solution? So yeah. kind of applied those analytical and problem solving skills to the fashion world and then taking textile waste, which is a huge issue, mm. and then kind of redesigning that into something that can be reworn again. So it kind of meshed those two parts of my yeah. brain together. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And I think in, in psychology, when we're talking about fashion design, there's this um, idea called design thinking, which is just like a psychological approach to designing. And one big part of design thinking is being solution fo um, a solution focused when you are creating something. So a lot of the times I think when designers create, it's all about, oh, what's trending and like maybe what will sell and what, what they personally like. But what I love of both of you guys is that you've actually taken a problem and your which is the climate crisis and like overconsumption and waste and people being disconnected with your clothes and you're thinking okay how can I how can we correct this in a way that's still cute and fun and I think that's just amazing and I want you to tell us a bit more is that about your your workshops too so you have your your sip and sews like how do they come about and like what do people tell you about them after after they've completed it as well um it was quite organic I think the first one I ever did um, I don't know if you guys know Kalechi, they're like a creative agency. Yeah, so mm -hmm. they reached out and they were like, oh, do you want to do this workshop in the Tate, Britain? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, of course. So obviously they'd seen my work and been following each other. I've been to like quite a few of their events and support them. So I was like, yeah, of course, I want to do that. And I just yeah. kind of took the leap and was like, yeah, let me try this out, see what it brings. Um, so it was my first ever workshop and it went amazingly. I think okay. I never saw myself as a teacher, but I knew that I wanted to have, again, like Lydia, how you said, like I wanted to have a teaching aspect to my brand, but I didn't know how I was going to like execute that. Yeah. Um, and like, not just, yeah, not just sell clothes, but actually teach people how they could actually sew and upcycle their own stuff themselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it went from there. And then I think I got a few more gigs throughout the year and then, um, yeah, it just kind of kept happening organically and then mm -hmm. I started like running the sip and sew specifically um so working with Wolf and Badger when I got stocked with them online um yeah, and yeah those were obviously amazing as well so again it had that more social aspect to it yeah. and people actually really wanted to like make friends as well at these events so mm. I thought it was, it was a nice way to make it more sociable yes um still fun and still had that you know sustainability and upcycling aspect to it so it kind of tied all those elements together and it yeah, people love us. <laughs> oh, that's great. And Lydia, did you ever see yourself as a teacher as well? Because you, you guys both are your teachers, right? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I wanted to do, like, same as that. Like, I knew I wanted to do that, like, skill sharing. Um, I'm not sure I'm naturally, like, a teacher. Like, my mum was a teacher, so and oh. she's really good at Oh, it's in, the, it's in the DNA. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> like nah. really good example of someone who is a really good teacher like my mum is so good at explaining things and like she taught me how to sew like she's really good and I can see myself and I'm like I'm, I'm not sure like teaching 
I've now I'm now good, I guess, because I've done a lot of it. I mean, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't my natural skill set. Mm. Um, but I like chatting, so I'm good at that aspect. I yeah. let people have a good time because I like mm. to chat to them. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I hear myself explain something, and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Like, is that really explain why i'm not too sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but yeah you guys are smashing it with these workshops and these courses but i want to talk about the collabs like you guys are the queen of collabs lydia i'll start with you first i'm seeing little logos i'm seeing nike logos like tell us about these collabs i really think people like to know how they came about and yeah what the process of it was like just tell us a bit more if you can well, whatever you can tell us <laughs> yeah so they do also come about quite organically um um, and Rosette, it's probably the same as you. They come about from just like consistently putting out work and people just seeing what you do. Mm -hmm. And then like when it's the right time for them, they kind of get in contact. That's kind of my experience with a lot of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, when I work with brands, it's always reusing secondhand textiles. Like that's like the main, re like the, the only way that we work together. So sometimes maybe brands have got in contact, but it's not really been so much about that so yes then we haven't worked together so it's always focused on reusing um either dead stock so like when i did workshops with nike we were reusing um defected like track suits and stuff so like patchworking mm. all the track suits together um to make like frilly cushions or also it was defected um football jerseys and then yeah, so I've done, I've done quite a few and they're yeah. really fun to do. And they yeah. kind of also give me like different creative license within my work because okay. I don't need to think about the products being sold in the same way. Yeah. Um, so if it's a workshop, we can make something more creative or like with Lidl, I did these three upcycled Christmas jumpers. Yeah, that photo shoot it was giving like high fashion like it was yeah, so the, the tiktok <laughs> ads were really so good like, as well get way more creative with it and then mm -hmm. not need to think so much about the end buyer because they're just being rented yes. so they could be like way more uh, fun okay yeah 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 so they gave did they give you free like creative license did you get to pick the the materials you were going to be using like how did it work um yeah pretty much so they did have um they wanted it to be inspired by um, three Christmas icons. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of, they kind of had like a brief like that. And they also wanted them to be in the brand colors. So one blue, one yellow, one red. Mm -hmm. um, but that was about it. And then everything else is just, I could kind of do whatever I wanted, which is so oh, fun. And nice. I feel like quite a rare project really to work on where you can just like be as creative as you want. Yes. Um, and the main thing was just like doing it within the time frame it was kind of, yeah oh how long did they give you to make them um i think i had about two and a half to three weeks okay um but with this it's meant the sourcing adds so much time mm. kind of so i go to loads of charity shops but then that's like kind of potluck of what you're going to find and because uh. i knew i needed specific colors it then makes it you've got like a bit more of a filter so yeah. then I was just like searching for so long for like a yellow jumper. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yellow jumper in some charity shop in London. Um, so that adds a lot of time. Yeah. And then also if I buy stuff from like secondhand um, online marketplaces that also then have like a week's delivery. So that kind of slows the process down. Yeah, I think that's something that I've heard people who say, oh, they don't want to go to the charity shops or online is the, oh, not knowing like exactly what you're going to get. But then I tell them yeah. at the same time, like if you're like super intentional, it's almost like a bit like a treasure hunt because when you do find it, that euphoria, like that feeling <laughs> that you put in the work and you've gotten a reward, it's going to like feel much better than just grabbing something that you know an algorithm or the website just told you to get like it's something definitely worth considering and I know you must have experienced yeah. that when you got your hands yeah. on your pieces I, I did because then I was going to meet my friend and then I thought I'll just go a bit early and like look in Dalston and then I yeah. saw it and I was like yes this is perfect <laughs> this is so, so exactly you get so excited when you find it yeah and then also just from like the personal shopping point of view in charity shops when you find something which you love it is so special mm -hmm. and you really keep it for such a long time and you yeah. know that like you said the treasure hunt of it yes um, so I think it really yeah oh that's it's brilliant and you're based in London, is that right? Yeah, based in yeah. London. Maybe, can you tell us some of your favorite charity shops? I get asked that question a lot, and I think there'll be, you'll probably have way more insight than me. I do get asked that a lot, and I find it quite hard, because oh. I also think, because there's always, stuff is always changing. Like, I used to love um, Holloway Road. 
Mm. Like in, near Fisher Park, I used to live near there, and I used to go. I used to always find so much stuff in those charity shops. But then I went recently, and I didn't find very much. So then I thought, I don't know if I should recommend that. <laughs> My favourite bit is when there's loads on a road and you can just go to one road and then go to like loads of different shops. Mm-hmm. Um, so also I like Kingsland Road in Dalston, that is really good for yeah. loads in a stretch. Yeah. Um, and then I also, I actually, I haven't done this recently, I hadn't done this for ages, but then recently went to like, um, where it's like Earl's Court, I think it's Earl's Court? Mm-hmm. Earl's Court and then the walk basically to Parsons Green. And I think I went to about 14 charity shops. It was like a re- it was like a it was like a day trip. It did take like wow. a, a walk, but there were so <laughs> many. Um, and they yeah, they had a lot of interesting pieces. Oh, brilliant! Um, Rosette, I know you probably have some recommendations that you can share with us. Some charity shops that you love. Yeah, I think Camden is always a good one. Camden mm-hmm. High Street because I found some really like quirky bits in there. I think because it's quite close to central London in that yeah. kind of slightly more affluent area next door. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> find some like designer pieces in there or like I think a lot of manufacturers also send like any like dead stock as well and like mm-hmm. quite like yeah small small batches to there yeah. um and when I used to go to college in um Finchley that was such a good area for gems like really? some of the stuff I bought there I still have today so like 10 years strong oh, nice um, so yeah it just varies though it's hard to say like what specific ones yeah are. you never know you never know what you're gonna find in each no one. that's so true but I think some people just they get absolutely lost like there's a charity shop near me and I go in there I'm just it's just never it's just never good it's never popping and that would I think if I was just a random person that would maybe put me off but I think it's the yeah. key is keep trying and just keep going out and yeah fashion like shopping it could be an activity you know it doesn't just have to be about the end goal it's the process it's the journey of finding something that you like it's it should be fun and it quite can be a nice experience too um but I want to get back to our our topic about collabs so um Lydia I know it was so like interesting to hear about cyclists and how there was like research that said half of them wish they had more high fashion but also cycle friendly clothing can you tell us more about your collaboration with Lime? yeah so that was a really interesting collab and it was also like you mentioned at the beginning that was solution focused Mm -hmm. so they'd done research to find the reasons why people don't cycle or like the 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 clothing that gets in the way when they cycle and then we designed all the clothing as a solution based off the research so one of them was that like people's coats always get caught in the wheels so then Mm. I designed this coat which is a long coat but then it zips off at the waist to then be a short coat and then the bit that zips off then packs up and then can be folded on folded and attached to like the front of your coat yeah so that was to help the cycle ride. And then one of them was a reflective vest and that was because people didn't feel safe cycling at night. But then also, you know, people who use line bikes, like I love line bikes and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I don't own a bike, but I use the line bike kind of, it's like my transition. It's like A to B. I'm mm-hmm. like going from one place to like then go out in the evening and I, I'm not going to carry a safety vest with me, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want something to feel safer, then the clothing needs to work on that transition. Yeah. Um. So then the safety vest, vest, it was like a vest that had reflective elements, but also was like, you'd be happy wearing it afterwards when you'd got to your destination. Mm. Um. And then there was a pair of pack up shorts because for me like one of the main reasons I don't want to cycle in the summer is like if I'm wearing like a little skirt or a dress and just being like oh people can see up my skirt yeah, I don't just like, like it. showing it too much yeah, oh, yeah. so uncomfortable yeah. um so that was like little pack up shorts which again fold up really small so then they, they could go in your bag mm-hmm. um so then you can pop your shorts on do your cycle ride and then take them off and you're like looking cute wherever you wherever you get to after yeah um and then the final one was um trouser ties so this is again people's trousers always getting caught in the chain Mm. so I made these trouser ties but they also are quite like cute so they work as key rings because it's the idea that it needs to be something that you would always have on you so you could have your keys on it Uh, or whatever it could like clip on your keychain um and then when you cycle when you get your line bike you can then put it around your trousers so they don't get caught 
That is so smart, especially now that skinny jeans are out and like the wide legs are in. Like people <laughs> definitely need. I think chances are just getting wider. They're getting wider, wider, wider. And that's yeah. not going to work on the pedals. I love that fashion should be yeah, it should be looking good, but also functional as well. Yeah. Oh, that's so great! Congratulations on that, Nitya. And Rosa, I know you you've been doing your, your collabs as well. I know you've done what was it, the Deep Up with Adidas and then Levi's. Tell us more. Like how did it come up quite organically? Like Lydia said, like how how did this come about and what what were they if people didn't know tell them yeah similarly quite organic I think mm-hmm. the first one with um Depop and Adidas that was literally through Instagram so I posted mm-hmm. my white asymmetric crop top mm-hmm. um spark the core collection and they reposted it like I think a few like months later yeah. um and then they reached out and they were like oh like do you have you considered like selling on Depop and then I was like no nah, not really <laughs> <laughs> stop in your blessings no <laughs> But then I was like, actually, I could sell like some of my experimental pieces and like the samplings, the samples that I create that don't like make it to the final kind of Mm -hmm. collection um, on there. Um, So I was like, okay, cool, let's do that then. And then they started like pushing my profile and kind of sharing Mm -hmm. that um, on like the homepage of Depop and stuff like that. And then Mm -hmm. I think like another like few months went by and then they were like, oh, we have this collaboration with a big brand, obviously NDA, so they couldn't tell me who the brand was. I was like, okay, cool let's do it mm-hmm. and then um yeah it turned out to be adidas obviously yeah and they um they had these um evergreen stan smiths okay so the upper was made from i think it was recycled materials just the upper was made from recycled materials and they wanted a few creators to um use use remnants from their studio to customize them yeah so i think it was like 10 of us who did this project um, so we all got a pair of Stan Smiths to customize along with like some paints and then use any kind of waste material from our creations to kind of design them. So I did like a slow fashion is sexy kind of um, writing thing and then like go green on the other side and then loads <laughs> of denim embellishments and stuff on the other side. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it was a really cool collaboration. I never done like footwear customization before. Mm. So it was very, very a different kind of challenge but also really really fun yeah um and then with Levi's that was also quite organic so I'm part of um a Google group called the guest list okay um, I'm sure you've heard of them yeah they, oh I haven't they, actually they, yeah what are they oh, okay mm-hmm. it's kind of like a group of creatives in like different industries um to kind of just connect with each other mm-hmm. share opportunities um share grants events promote yourself kind mm-hmm. of vibe so mm-hmm. um there was an opportunity put out there about a collaboration with a known denim brand um, again, <laughs> yeah. um, so I kind of put myself forward and then they did interviews and then I got the job so oh, okay. um, we did um, four tutorials showing yeah. how you can level up your Levi's which is what the series is called mm-hmm. um, so the first one was using a stencil so it kind of worked up from kind of basic easy level to like more intermediate level so the first one was using a stencil and just like paint to put a design on the on any part of your jeans yeah and then the second one was embellishments so sewing on like little pearls and gems and chains and then the third one was patchwork applique so I did like a patchwork Mm. um jean situation and the third one was um turning jeans into a bag so I did a reworked reversible crossbody bag yeah so those are like rolling out over the next few weeks but yeah that was an amazing cloud and yeah it was it was incredible to actually be like (laughs) on that project so oh congratulations to you both yeah it is definitely a blessing and I'm sure both of you guys you must get a lot of DMs of people saying oh how can I get into this how can I be like you I know I get a lot like how can I do this but I think what's coming through from both of you is that you just kept going you just kept going kept going kept going and then some people might see you they might not come at you straight away but they might you know they they note you and then they come back when the timing is right but it's just about like keep going I think some people get disheartened they think oh I don't have all of these followers or I don't have all of this but if you're so passionate like the both of you are and you just keep doing what you love these opportunities will come and then also like you said Rosa like putting yourself in the position to be ready and then when opportunities come even though you haven't done something before believing yourself going for it and just trying something new um but I want to keep on that topic about the Levi's so I you do a lot of denim I think that's something that so a material that connects with you I want to ask like why like what is your love of denim like as as a material how do you like work with it as well I think when I was younger, I just loved buying loads of different pairs of jeans. 
<laughs> so I used to go to these like um, vintage markets and sales, and they had like vintage Levi's for one pound. Mm -hmm. This was like ages ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it. this is gonna be. <laughs> You're not gonna oh buy that. God. Oh my gosh. Of course I'm gonna buy these. So I used to literally like lug home like a big bag on the train <laughs> of jeans and like random stuff that I'd bought. Yeah. Um so when I was starting obviously like designing and like reworking and thinking, okay, how can I start making some pieces for my brand? Mm -hmm. I was like, well, let me just use what I've got already rather than going out and buying more stuff. Yeah. Um so I started using some of the jeans that are like maybe a bit more worn or I just wasn't wearing them as frequently. So I started customizing with them. So it kind of happened naturally, organically from my existing wardrobe mm -hmm. um and then I was like actually let me actually focus on denim because you know through the research that I started doing and finding out that it takes 10,000 liters of water to make a pair of jeans from like wow. the growing point to like the dyeing process like mm -hmm. I was like okay this actually makes sense for me to focus on denim because yeah. if this was to end up in landfill like what a waste um mm. all of that kind of extensive production process um yeah. so it was actually happened kind of naturally but then through the research I was like this is actually a really good angle and a really good material to work with and of course denim is sturdy so it lasts it can last a lifetime basically like a good pair of Levi jeans will last you yeah. literally your whole life <laughs> oh, it's so true um, and I actually really like working with a sturdy material because I found it more interesting to play with and the fraying and how you could dye it and bleach it um I found a lot more experiments yeah I could do more experimentation with it yeah. Um, so I stuck with denim, but I definitely want to branch out into other materials as like my brand grows. So that was just a good starting point for me. And everyone has a pair of jeans, so. Everyone <laughs> does. This yeah, is so exactly. random, but I just remembered this TikTok where someone said that they, they instead of like washing their jeans too regularly, they put them in the freezer. Have you guys ever heard of that one? Okay. Yeah. Has anyone ever done it? Do you know if it works? Yeah. I've yeah. never done it. <laughs> Have I you done, done it personally? It? But I've yeah. heard because of like I think it kills the bacteria mm. in the jeans. Yeah, I know. If, 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 kind of process. Yeah, I'm sure if my mom sees my pair of Levi's next to like the mutton, she'd be like, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> um so this wouldn't be the biggest energy podcast if we didn't get a bit of fashion psychology in there so this actually i'm speaking about denim there is an old psychology study that says that darker denim as opposed to lighter denim is perceived as being um more expensive and people like see people wearing darker denim as being like more rich than those wearing lighter does this ring true for you is have you is that something you noticed I mean, I know that there's the Japanese indigo denim, which is of a higher quality. Mm. So that is a darker shade of denim. Yeah. But personally, I am more of a standard blue denim kind of girly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's just like my personal style kind of vibe. Yeah. But I did have one jacket, which was like a Japanese indigo um, kind of denim. And it was like high quality and something that I've had for years. So yeah, um, it definitely has that literally high quality um, production process and um vibe to it as well i think yeah but i think for me personally i'm more of like just a standard blue <laughs> yeah <laughs> wait what would you say standard blue is like slightly like lighter or the the kind of mid um, i don't know i've got a pair of jeans here oh yeah let's see a little off cut this kind of blue is a bit of see blue. i would say that's lighter blue than standard yeah. blue yeah what do you think lydia i i in terms of levi's i would that's the color i would imagine as yeah. Blue. Oh, okay. Kind of standard blue, yeah. Standard yeah. blue. You guys Maybe had a little first. bit lighter, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So, Lydia, I want to come to you next. Um, let's talk about your favorite pieces. Can you share us share a story behind some of your favorite pieces that you've made? Where did the fabric come from? What did you transform it into? I love the story behind clothes and I think both of you guys everything you make just tells such a story which is why upcycling customizing is so powerful so I'd love to hear that Lydia my yeah I find it's really hard to choose because <laughs> they're all kind of like your little children <laughs> I know, they're like, they're like I love I love them all and they're like different ways yeah um and then also I kind of feel like when I'm over them, I'm over them. And then I've got a new idea and I'm into that one instead. So then maybe I disregard them. I don't know. Um, but my favorite things I've made, my favorite things have always been like when I found like a rare, a rare as in, I don't find very, don't find very many of them, not necessarily mm -hmm. rare because they've got like a certain value level, okay. like a rare kind of like tablecloth or blanket. Um, I've done some with like fruit on and they're so hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, and then they just make pieces that people, like people just go like wild for them. And <laughs> I, 
then they always yeah and it's just so hard to find any like more tablecloths like that so I did mm-hmm. one a few years ago which was like blue gingham with fruit painted on it mm-hmm. and people just went like really I made it into like this little jacket and I actually made the jacket I actually made it as like a toile because I was making a leather jacket for my friend and I thought well I'll just make the toile like in a fabric that I think is cute because then it's not a waste of me you know making the toile yeah. so anyway I made it and it was just so cute and everyone yeah everyone went like wild for it they loved it um and yeah so they're they're my my most special pieces are when I find like a piece of fruity fabric because yeah. they're so hard to come by um <laughs> and I'm always searching like fruit and I just it's like it's hard to describe but it's like a certain quality to these fruity ones like mm-hmm. they it's not just like any fruit they're like it's just the design of the tablecloth is a certain yeah. yeah fruity style that just um is really right oh that's so cute and what's your stance on wearing your favorites are you wear your favorites or save your favorites kind of person um well I sometimes will wear normally I might or like wear it to take photos and then I just sell it all oh. <laughs> I don't keep any of it um sometimes I wish I did Mm. yeah I'm kind of so these little jumpers that are going on by rotation yeah I wish I was keeping those but I'm not because I I'm really pleased I'm really like the red one which has got the bows I'm like oh it's so cute um but no they all but I think it's kind of quite nice I think it's part of the process is that they yeah like I remake it and then it goes on yeah yeah oh that's I guess that's less nice it's like sharing your art and your creation with the world then that's still you still get the good feels from that even though you're not yeah. personally wearing it yourself and I feel like that like I'm love by rotation and I've had a dress that I literally just wore to take pictures and like just saved it I didn't really have an occasion to wear it but I put it on the app and then I rented it and some girl she was in a wedding and all the bridesmaid dresses were that dress that I had but they didn't have her size and she was able to rent it in my size and then she showed me a picture of her in the wedding and I was like oh my god my dress it went out in the world and you know it was part of a special day and that makes you feel good I love when when clothes tell us stories I, it's probably the same for you that you know, when you see people wearing your creations yeah yeah I've also mm-hmm. have a dress that someone rented and then it was like the first time she rented anything and then she was like I had so much fun wearing it like I loved it and then yeah it's such a nice feeling mm-hmm. when you're like wow I would that dress wasn't doing anything for me in my wardrobe yeah exactly <laughs> exactly I love like sharing is really yes. nice fashion bringing people together is brilliant and Rosette so you recently helped me with an article I was writing for Mr Porter it's not out yet but oh my god that was stress to write it's basically 33 tips on how to get through um, winter like sadness winter blues and I needed 33 experts with the 33 tips oh my god it was a lot but Rosette kindly helped me with that and um, during it we were talking about like upcycling and like creativity and how creativity actually um has positive benefits on your well-being and your mental health and people who've engaged in creative activities I think it increases longevity of their lifespan like it's just so good and I wanted to ask you personally like what feeling do you get when when you make something from scratch like what does it do for you um oh that's deep (laughs) (laughs) we get deep here (laughs) it definitely has that sense of you know fulfillment and like oh my god I made that mm. <laughs> um so obviously the serotonin is just like yeah. up high. <laughs> um but I think it also challenges me in a creative way to be like okay cool I have this like old pair of jeans or old pair of whatever and then how can I transform this into something that I will love and wear and actually enjoy again yeah. Um, so I think creatively it challenges me, but when I'm done creating that piece, I feel so like accomplished and like, yeah. wow, I actually did it. Mm-hmm. Even if it doesn't go right, yeah. I still then like go back to it and then like rediscover it. Yeah. Uh, maybe sit on it for a few days and then like transform it again to then get it to like a piece that I really, really love. Um, and at the end, yeah, it's just like, oh my God, I did this. And it's so amazing. I think that's <laughs> the like, key. Yeah. Even if it doesn't go right, you still stick with because it. Because it doesn't always go right. <laughs> always goes wrong in sewing I feel like sewing is just things going wrong 
but even like in the unpicking process and like mm -hmm. cutting and like I think there's something about using your hands that mm. just makes you feel like okay wow I'm actually creating something you feel really like empowered by it as well yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like Lindsay, how do you keep going after something goes wrong? Because I, I have a sewing machine, but when I broke that needle like the third time, I said, forget this. And I literally, I don't think I've looked at that sewing machine since then. How do you like keep going and not get frustrated? Um, I think I just know that's the process. Mm. Uh, but like, so when I now do quite a lot of workshops and I'm showing people how to use the machines, so I'm like, it like sewing always goes wrong like, especially at the beginning like it doesn't yeah. matter it's really easy to unpick mm. um and I guess anyway with the upcycling we're used to unpicking so you know yeah. we spend loads of time unpicking so that's fine yeah um so yeah I guess I don't make as many mistakes as I used to which is also good um <laughs> but yeah I think you just you just know it's part of the process yeah yeah it's annoying when you cut something wrong and mm -hmm. you can't do anything about it that's really annoying yeah. um <laughs> but when it's just sewing it's just like yeah, and I, yeah. I also think it's kind of, I definitely, you could kind of, when something's been hard or gone wrong the first time, and then like the next time it's easier or you're quicker or you're better, you can like, it's nice to see quite literally like your skills improving. Yeah. And, like, you know, that's quite like a, a, like a good feeling. And then like mm -hmm. you're getting all those new neural pathways and you're like, yeah, I'm actually mm -hmm. really getting better at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Which I think then like helps for the next time when it's going wrong and you're finding it tricky, mm -hmm. but then you know like, okay, all those other times I then got way better. So this will yes. happen. I just need to like push through it. Yeah, so stick with it guys. Even yeah. if you don't be like me, just keep going. <laughs> um, and Lydia, like how do you feel when like you see um, like people connecting with a piece that they've upcycled um, and like, do they compare it with things that they've just like bought off the high street and like worn it once? Like has you, have you had like a personal story from someone? Um, yeah, it's really cute because they're always just so excited that it's something they've made themselves. And then, like, so I do at the moment a lot of scrunchie workshops and people just leave so excited and they're, like, holding it. Like, either they've put it in their hair or they've, like, put it in their bag and they're just, like, you can just see they're so excited about something they've made. And normally they're like, wow, that took a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> Making, like yeah we've kind of lost lost the um like we're detached from how long clothes take to make and like yes. the actual skills that all everyone all garment workers have to create pieces of clothing mm -hmm. because like how inexpensive clothing can be so i think when people come to a workshop and they really see like they use their hands and see how long things take and like experience that i think yeah. it helps them like remember that actually all of, like most of your clothing has been made by a human and like mm -hmm. they all are so skilled and i think it helps like yeah remind people of that value yeah and then they really love what they've made yeah that's great. And I think it's interesting because into when you think about research into um, why we buy things. So we all get that dopamine high, you know, dopamine is that feel good hormone in our brain linked to the reward centers. And once we go shopping, dopamine spikes, right? But people, um, research suggests that when we online shop dopamine increases even more because that's there's that anticipation between when you actually click to purchase and when you get something and because it's unpredictable the longer that anticipation is the more dopamine you get and i'm thinking well it must be the same for when you're creating something right that process is such a long time to get to the end goal but you because you're you're going through it and you're creating and you're adding more and more like that, that dopamine is going to increase and increase and increase which is why at the end your your clients people in your workshops they they obviously must feel so fantastic and so great but because it's taken a long time, but they finally reach that end goal. They reach that reward, um, which I think is just going to be so much higher than just getting something offline, online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people that come haven't done sewing before, so they're not maybe that experienced on the machine. So maybe they're not that good yet, mm -hmm. um, but they still love it. Yeah. So even even if the sewing maybe isn't perfect, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter to them. And they, they're yeah. just like really, like, it's really cute. Um, that's really interesting about online shopping. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's all about the anticipation. Yeah. Sometimes it's not even the happiness is not even tied to the thing that you're getting. It's the it's the really? waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. Wow. So That's cool. very interesting. Yeah. Um Rosette, what would you say um to someone to encourage them to repurpose their clothes? I think a lot of times people might try something on and oh it doesn't fit. And it's just like, oh, they'll just wear it a bit baggy or they just wear it, like hide their holes. Like what would you say to them to actually encourage them to to do something about that? Um, I think it's just about, I guess, showing them how easy it can be. Mm -hmm. Um, so like finding little easy alternatives and methods to maybe like altering a garment or 
going to a workshop and you know making it a whole social experience rather than like mm. this boring like I don't know <laughs> stiff thing that you have to do yeah um so like discovering like your d- local dry cleaners and seeing if there's a they have a maker in the space that yeah. can actually like alter some of your clothes yeah um and as a result like if you just do one and like you see how that garment fits you so well and snug and like that confidence will then I guess lead you on to do more yes because yeah for me like once something fits me really well once it's like tailored to my body like I just feel like okay cool I can I can run this world no it's so <laughs> true like, yeah I just feel so empowered so I think demonstrating how easy it can be and the different ways in which they can tap into upcycling and rental and like yeah mending different kind of ways to enjoy their clothing a bit more um will make it more appealing because people don't like stress they don't like things that are like oh I have to go here to do this yeah. or I have to blah, blah. <laughs> just trying to make it simplified a simplified process I think that would definitely help encourage people to do more of it yeah true and I love what you said about dry cleaners I think people don't realize that there's lots of local dry cleaners still about mine down mm-hmm. my road I would say Jim I love Jim he's like a 70 year old man Aww. and I give him all of my jeans because I don't understand why they don't make jeans that go in at the waist but they're wider they? they just don't make it and if you see it on those websites they have the clip at the back they're not really shaped <laughs> like that um and when I discovered that and I went discovered Jim and he took in all of my jeans I just fell back in love with my wardrobe and I wore them more and it just increased the value of them and it, it was so um important to me and I feel like I saved so much money trying to like find the perfect pair of jeans when exactly. I had them but they just needed to to be better and like you said the confidence as well studies show that when we see people wearing tailor-made clothing we perceive them as being more resourceful more flexible more powerful um because when we see people wearing things that are like perfect for them we just perceive them in a better light so you get that internal advantage and the external advantage as well so it's so mm. so true yeah um and then Lydia so yeah um yeah. Lydia why do you think then that there is this attitude behavior gap when it comes to people wanting to be sustainable if you look at all the surveys especially Gen Z millennials well yeah sustainability but then we actually don't go through with it like fast fashion sales over consumption <laughs> everything is just going up like why are we in this in this like push and pull like kind of space right now yeah I think it's a lot to do with convenience I mm. think like our world is just everything is so convenient and that's just it's really like being more sustainable is kind you do kind of have to slightly shift your mindset and kind of slightly turn your back not always but I think I think people think it you have to slightly turn your back on maybe the most convenient way of living so kind of like going to charity shops or searching secondhand Mm -hmm. it might take longer but like your dopamine hit is way bigger but it, it is it's a lot slower a process than just being like searching okay I'm finding it on a fast fashion website or a high street website getting it um so I think it is like it just takes a bit more time um but also something I heard from you when we did that panel talk was like the pat on the back theory oh yeah 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. that's super interesting and I had never heard of that so I guess maybe it's also we all want to be sustainable but then we I don't know reuse our bag so then we think okay I've reused my bags so and that's okay so <laughs> yeah exactly yeah basically the pat on the back theory is that like if you get if you do like one kind of good like green action then and you just feel good about that you're less likely to like continue because you just feel like that goodness carries on in the day so say you took the bus instead of taking your car like you're like oh I did my good thing like I can buy like 10 fashion of <laughs> like jumpsuits or t-shirts right now like that so that's hard that so that's something that we have to contend with and, and like you said the convenience as well so changing your habits is something that's incredibly hard I think it takes around some research says it takes like 66 days and I think people think that oh I'd like I bought something that's fast fashion like oh let me just like give up let me just do that but it takes time like I think people should also give themselves grace like yeah it's yeah. just about making those small changes like going to a workshop one day maybe instead of just buying something new switching the way you have something switching the way you wear something that you've already worn maybe a lot of times like just doing those small habits and then if you can cons- consistently do that you'll end up in a in a better position where your your beliefs match up to your behaviors when it comes to sustainability yeah mm-hmm. and I love that and I love that you too you're not because I know some people in the sustainability space they're just 
if you act like this, if you buy this, you're you're dead to me. Like you're killing the planet. Like just get out of this place. But I think that can turn a lot of people away, right? And it can be quite yeah. overwhelming. Um, so I love you guys are doing it in a very like in a mindful, thoughtful, and like in an educational way, which is great. Um, and I want to come to you, Rosette, and ask you like, how does revival envision like its role in shaping the future? of sustainable fashion and like what maybe projects Ooh. or initiatives what are you working towards to kind of to promote like the eco-conscious um future consumer that's a chunky one <laughs> um, i think the main thing for me is i think navigating the workshop space a lot better mm -hmm. yeah and having maybe a more consistent um process with that um and also embedding that into like maybe corporate worlds as well mm. so that i actually reaches not just the people who love sustainability but actually the people who have probably never even thought about sustainability yeah. because it's all good and well us being in our little sustainable bubble <laughs> but we need to reach the people who actually might not even care or might not even think about how they're consuming fashion um, and try and shift their mindset in a way so thinking yeah. about how I can yeah navigate the workshop space and bring it to more people yes. um, on a bigger scale I think also I'm really interested in embedding technology in fashion and I guess exploring more innovative kind of angles with like textiles and textiles that can be actually like circular. Mm. Um, so basically that means that, you know, from production to wear and tear to that consumer, you know, enjoying the garment to then um, end life of that garment. How can we then keep that leap, loop um, in a circular kind of shape and not yeah. end up in landfill? Um, so I definitely want to explore some projects in, I don't know, the next five years, I guess in the innovative space and partner up with like people who are in that kind of world um, and how we can fuse those two ideas together to create textiles that would be, yeah, circular. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the main things that I'm kind of like thinking about right now. I think that's brilliant. I love what you said about popping the sustainability bubble because I think a lot of times when I get into like these spaces, it's the it's the same people and it's people who are already they already believe in these things, right? It's like yeah. preaching to the choir. But then if you go down the road and you speak to someone about like ESG goals and net zero, they're like, huh? Like what's that? Like they don't know. Like it's we need to like reach out and talk about these things in a way that is accessible for people yeah. to understand and to do and and I think that's incredibly important so congratulations with that and I'm, I'm loving to see what we're going to do pushing the workshops forward um Lydia I want to talk a bit more about psychology and like your personal psychology how do you think psychology influences like your work and maybe what have you learned about like yourself your mental well-being like how has that helped you facilitate the stuff that you're doing in the sustainability space um i i think in terms of my my work i think it's kind of really le like it's obviously slow fashion mm -hmm. um i call myself a slow fashion sustainable designer but in terms of like building the brand it was like really actually thinking that will then also apply to like how my brand grows and kind mm -hmm. of like you know not wanting things to happen instantly and yeah. thinking it should be growing really quickly but kind of when i really like step back and be like no it's a slow fashion brand like things will grow more slowly because of all like the time I'm taking to create things and because I'm really the brand is like rooted in its values and mm -hmm. in my values um so but then I think maybe compared to watching other brands grow who kind of don't work it as in an upcycling way so you can kind of like mass produce more and grow quicker mm -hmm. I think like it was kind of yeah like really the psychology of being like really yeah, like I uh, will grow more slowly and like kind of accepting that. Yes. I don't know, the psychology of that, that sort of thing really mm -hmm. is something I've learned. Um, and also like kind of not having, I, th I don't know if I'm getting too deep now, but it's like not having like a lack mindset and just always have, mm -hmm. like trying to like maintain like an abundant positive mindset. Like there's so many opportunities, opportunities constantly coming to me and to everyone else. Yeah. Um, and then like, kind of switching my mindset to be like more like not about like yeah any sort of lack but always just about like endless I don't know has really helped me and my brand grow <laughs> oh I love that I think that's super yeah. positive um maybe raise that same question like what like how have you like adapted your well-being or like the way that you think and your mental health to help you like support the growth of revival yeah, I think similarly, I've I've thought about like, oh, why am I not like, growing on a certain level? Mm. 
And it's like, yeah, because you're trying to do things in a more mindful and conscious way. Like yeah. you're not a typical fast fashion brand. So mm-hmm. you're not going to be doing, you know, whatever numbers they're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, readjusting my mindset in that sense has been a bit of a struggle because mm-hmm. I don't want to keep working full time. I don't want to keep working like other jobs. Um, I kind of want this to be my main gig. Um, so I think it's just been a process of like, okay, this is going to take some time. Just slow down, yeah. <laughs> take it easy mm-hmm. um, and let the brand kind of grow and evolve. And I want to do things more organically rather than like, okay, X amount of this needs to come out. X amount of products need to sell. Da, 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 da. So I've just, yeah, again, similarly to Lydia, I think approaching it in a more slower and conscious mindset has helped me. Um, but yeah, the part-time jobs are helping to pay the bills. So that's also <laughs> easing the financial yes. pressure yes. of like um, Revival being my main gig. But yeah, I think it will all work itself out. Mm. I think it's just a matter of time and continuing to do what I do and just leveling up and doing more of it. So yeah, oh, that's yeah. great. And I, I, that's why I feel like fashion psychology is just so prevalent because you're talking about like slowing down like fashion, you're creating slow fashion, right? But you're both saying like, yeah, we need to slow down the way that we think and the way that we're trying to achieve our goals and actually be more mindful with that. So it's like, like mindfulness, just like, it covers everything you guys are doing like all aspects of your life and that's why it's so important to to take care of your of your mental space as well um which is what you guys are doing it's great and last question to both of you Lydia I'll come to you first like what's the best piece of advice that you would give to someone who really wants to to change their ways and to to like lessen this attitude behavior gap um I think it's thinking about the full process of a product. So like where it came from and who made it, do you want to get like, I feel like, I think it's all, yeah, for me, it's a lot about where I spend my money is important. So I want to give my money, who do I want to give my money to? And I want to give my money to small independent brands because I want them to have more money and have better, more like growth and success. So I think, yeah, personally, I just think about where do I spend my money? And that's really important. Mm -hmm. Who do you want to have more money in the world? Well, like, obviously, independent brands who are amazing, as opposed to big companies that already have loads of money. Um, And then also just think about where does the product go afterwards? Is this going to be something you're going to really want for a long time? If you if you had to hang on to every single thing that you bought for the rest of your life, would you still buy it? Mm. Um, Because the world has to hang on to it and it just will end up in someone else's country like polluting their land yeah but imagine if you had to hang on to it and then where would you still buy it do you still want it Mm -hmm. um so I think it's kind of that like yeah really thinking about things and aside from just like the impulse of do you want it for now but like the longevity of how long you're actually going to really want it for brilliant and same to you Rosette what best advice would you give to someone um I think one thing that's I think just the easiest thing to do is just consume less um mm. just don't need 10 10 of those tops. <laughs> don't need 500 dresses um so I think step number one that's how I started out anyway is just consuming less and thinking actually I don't need all of these garments because mm. first of all I don't even have the space mm. <laughs> in my wardrobe yeah and secondly yeah when I look at like what's going on in like for, for example Ghana and how a lot of the clothes that we buy that are fast fashion, mm-hmm. they just end up there. We think that, oh, we're just going to give to charity shops. A lot of those clothes don't end up being sold on the charity shop floor, shop mm-hmm. floor. Mm-hmm. Um, they just get sent to, you know, countries in the global south. And then they they can't sell those products on in their secondhand yeah. market. So that's okay. then polluting their local communities, mm-hmm. their beaches, mm-hmm. even like, like just the general landscape. So um, I think obviously I have that insight into seeing those documentaries and seeing those clips but people who may not have seen those things I think step number one is just consuming less because yeah. um yeah that's just the easiest thing to just yeah, pause pause mm-hmm. on the shopping a little bit yeah um yeah I think that's those are great pieces of advice guys I think people could definitely benefit from them and and I love the idea of like yeah consuming less because where you have to think about your space as well it just reminds me of something I did a podcast last season with Sophie Liard the folding lady and she says like when people come to her and they say oh I don't have enough space I don't have enough space she said no you've disrespected your space by stuffing it with too many clothes like that's and and I was like whoa like that's actually a great way of thinking about it like you've disrespected you've like not valued your space your space is beautiful but the way you're consuming is not. And I think that's something to think about as well. And I think even the value too, like 
I, I like think to people like do you think you're worth a 12p top like even you like do you think like you're worth that like you think you're worth this quality and like to feel like this and to get something that you don't even 100% sure of your that you like are you worth that so I think yeah shifting that mindset whilst also thinking about giving back to um smaller creators like you said Lydia and then also like Rosa thinking about the global community and like your impact and I think if we had all of those things together then definitely we'll see a change but I have loved talking talking to you guys so much Lydia tell the people where they can follow you hear more about you and what you have coming up next yeah so the main place um we follow me on Instagram and it's just Lydia Bolton with an underscore at the end Mm -hmm. Um, and then coming up I've got more workshops so if you want to make a scrunchie or do some um mending and repairs you can come to a workshop um although it's not for a little while I was doing an event on Earth Day where we kind of have like interesting talks in the morning and then workshops in the afternoon so that's always like a really fun thing although that's not for a few months but like that's like a nice thing coming up and helps like about like meeting more people who are also interested in it and like making friends Mm -hmm. um I think it's nice to like build your build your community of other people that are really interested in like mending and repairing brilliant and Rosette where can people hear more about you what do you have coming up next you want to share yeah, my personal Instagram is Thrift Queen Lola. Um, mm-hmm. So I share like upcycling, secondhand style, all of that good stuff. Mm-hmm. And then my brand is Revival LDN on all social platforms. Um, I've got a workshop in uh, two weeks on the 16th of December. Um, mm-hmm. So it's all about upcycling, um, Christmas stockings, and Christmas stuff. So that's anything good. for 2024. I don't think this podcast will be out. <laughs> Tell us something. Oh, 2024, no. what's coming up next no, year? No. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, 2024, keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> keep your eyes peeled. You heard it. Join the newsletter. Follow, follow, like, and subscribe. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. It's been another episode of the Big Just Energy podcast. You can follow me on Instagram at Shakayla Elise and on Instagram on TikTok as at Fashion is Psychology. And of course, by now, you guys know we have the new online course, Introduction to Fashion Psychology. You can sign up, learn about everything we've talked about in this. Design thinking, why we buy, how to buy more uh, mindfully, how to style stuff more mindfully. Um, all of this research and insights into fashion psychology. It's available you to learn in a in a twelve week intensive online course that you can do at your own time. So visit fashionispsychology.com forward slash courses. And again, stick around next week for another amazing episode. And thanks for listening. Yay.